I'm welcoming, I'm going to introduce you to Chris Whip. He's National Trust Manager for Heritage Policy and Government Relations and organizes the annual National Trust Conference. His family owns a historic farm near Walbur, Alberta, threatened by a coal strip mine and power plant. And thank you, Chris, for joining us. Hello, everyone. Yes, as Mario says, I'm Chris Weeb. I'm from the National Trust for Canada in Ottawa. And I'd like to begin by acknowledging that the Indigenous land on which I am broadcasting from, coming to you virtually, is the traditional unceded territory of the Algonquin Nation. So on behalf of the steering committee of Our World Heritage, welcome to the first of 12 monthly debates on world heritage issues that will be held throughout 2021. Our World Heritage is a public initiative primarily aimed at developing a stronger role for civil society in world heritage conservation efforts. Through this year of debates, we intend to develop a number of proposals for the enhancement of the world heritage system in 2022 to mark the 50th anniversary of the World Heritage Convention. The Our World Heritage uh, 2021 debates aim to raise general awareness about critical threats that natural and cultural world heritage sites are encountering from increasing development pressures, industrial and mining operations, mm -hmm. climate change, unsustainable tourism and conflicts, among other things, and to develop opportunities for the involvement of civil society in finding sustainable solutions to these issues. Our goal is to invoke a large group of professionals, NGOs, institutions, and citizens engaged in heritage protection, conservation, and management, and to organize a permanent network of civil society that's able to provide the public with an independent assessment of the situation at World Heritage Sites. From the beginning, this Our World Heritage Initiative has given priority to working with cultural and natural heritage places in all regions of the world and across generations. So far, Our World Heritage has been a successful virtual launch, uh, saw a virtual launch in November 2022, moderated by the dynamic international journalist, journalist Zainab Badawi. If you've not yet seen it, I encourage you to go and view it on the organization's uh, website. Today's debate on the transformational impacts of information technology has two goals. The first is to build a robust global network of organizations, uh, professionals and individuals interested in the topic. The second is to discuss ideas on how to enhance the use of information technologies to monitor our world heritage sites and to present multiple narratives through various tools of interpretation. The participation of over 400 people from around the world on this globe and today shows that the network is strong thanks to the tireless efforts of our co-conveners, co Mario Santana Quintero and Haifa Abdel Halim and the many, effort, uh, the many members of our team that are uh, also involved in this, uh, this program today. I'll invite each of you to get involved today and in all the other activities and debates this year. I look forward to hearing your ideas and hope you really enjoy the webinar. We will now screen a video on the transformational impacts of information and technology, and I'll pass the mic over to them. Thank you, Chris, for your kind words. And thank you, everyone of our team for this marvelous organization. So, Michelle, shall we go to the video? The digital revolution is transforming the ways people know, understand, use, and visit heritage sites. How is the World Heritage Convention addressing this historical transformation? How can collective knowledge and big data become tools for heritage conservation and foster its integration into comprehensive planning systems? How can information technology support transparency in and access to decision-making and management processes of the Convention? How can digital technologies, including social media, promote heritage education and awareness and provide support to the cultural and creative industries.
Within the theme of transformational impacts of information technology, we aim to establish a robust network of organizations and professionals. And work together to put forth policy recommendation to the World Heritage Committee at its 50th anniversary of the World Heritage Convention in 2022. Striving to inspire discourse and action, we are exploring how we can use technology to monitor our World Heritage sites and to present multiple narratives through various tools of interpretation. Be part of the conversation now and help it unfold in January 2021. Join us as we look for communities across the globe to propose ways to use the technology for monitoring World Heritage Sites. Propose ways that we can interpret and present the history of a site to tell multiple narratives. Put together an interdisciplinary team of community members, site custodians, nonprofit organizations, universities, institutions, and industry partners. Submit your notice of intention by December 11, 2020. Let us know if you would like to participate in the discussion and be part of the change. We will support you along the journey as we head into January 2021. Okay, so uh, before we go to our keynote speakers of this uh, plenary session, I would like to remind you about our global competition. The global competition is part of this, of creating this robust network and these, um, these proposals of ideas uh, for policy recommendations to the World Heritage Committee. So to do this, we have prepared two core aims to strengthen the monitoring of the World Heritage sites using the information technologies and to enhance the multiple narrative in the interpretation and presentation of World Heritage right. sites using information technologies. The deadline for submissions of letters of intent is January the 29th. And you can look at the website and you will find all the terms of reference for the submissions. It's fairly simple. And what we are seeking is international teams across the world working on a existing or potential ideas to integrate information technologies in these two important activities of world heritage uh, protection and conservation. So with this, we're going to pass now to our main team at Digitally Interconnected Our World Heritage. And for this reason, we have uh, selected six speakers to share some uh, experiences with you. And with our uh, coordinator, Christina Cameron, I will be sharing this session. So to commence this uh, activity, I would like to introduce our first speaker, which is actually Christina Cameron. And I will read Christina's uh, bio. Uh, uh, Christina is a member of the steering committee for our World Heritage and coordinator of our theme of today. She is an emeritus professor at the University of Montreal, and prior to joining the university, her career as a heritage executive with Parts Canada spanned more than 35 years. As director general of national historic sites, she provided national direction for Canada's historic places, focusing on the heritage conservation and education programs. She has been actively involved in World Heritage as head of the delegation for Canada, chairperson in different opportunities and rapporteur to the World Heritage Committee. And she has published a book on the early years of the World Heritage Convention. She has an MA in Museum Studies from Brown University in Rhode Island and a PhD in Architectural History from Laval University. And also, I, I would like to highlight that Christina is a person that uh, mentors emerging professions for a living. And you can see it in this particular theme where we have so many of our emerging professionals helping. So Christina, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Mario, for that comment. And uh, welcome to the Globinar. So far, it's been quite a, quite a ride around the world. So I'm happy to be in this session. And uh, I decided to become involved in our World Heritage because I was concerned about the conservation of World Heritage sites. And that's the subject of my brief intervention. So I just wanted to set the context in broad terms. So you all know that the World Heritage Convention is an international treaty and countries uh, uh, are devoted to, uh, or say they will protect and conserve these places that are important for all humanity. And you might be surprised that 
that right now there are only 53 sites out of 1,121 on the official list of World Heritage Sites in Danger. And that's only about 5% of all the World Heritage Sites. And this is a personal perspective, but I actually think that there, it, that there are many more sites that should be on that list, both cultural and natural, that have serious problems that need to be addressed. <clears throat> and for those of you who don't have an opportunity to watch the World Heritage Committee in action, it devotes three days to the state of conservation of all those World Heritage Sites. And each uh, session, it receives about 150 reports written by the Secretary at the World Heritage Center with input from the expert advisory bodies, IUCN, ICOMAS, and ICROM. Uh, and I would say that now the debate wasn't always this way, but now the debate, the debate on the state of conservation is now fundamentally political and not technical. Lots of the discussion goes around the words, how the wording is on the draft decision, but there's not that much discussion on conservation issues. And indeed, many draft decisions are adopted by the committee without any discussion. So the problem with this process is that there's no place for timely input from individuals and civil society groups who are actually very familiar with the sites and they know the problems well. And here I want to acknowledge that there has been some improvement in the process. Since uh, 2017, uh, civil society spokespersons who register in advance are invited by the chairperson of the committee to prevent their, present their views on a specific site, but only after the committee has taken its decisions and for only two minutes. Now, you've all worked in this field. The problem with the process is obviously two minutes is not long enough to explain complex conservation issues to the committee. And secondly, there's no, it has absolutely no impact on the decisions. I mean, what, what is the point of speaking to the committee after the decisions have been made? And that's why one of the goals of our World Heritage is to develop a stronger role for the voice of civil society in World Heritage conservation efforts. Now, there are many threats and Chris has named a number of them development, you know them anyway, development pressures, mining operations, climate change, pollution, over-tourism, conflicts, to name a few. But the information on these threats is very uneven, and that's where the Globinar comes in. I'm asking myself and you, how can information technologies be used to monitor these threats and to improve public access to information on the state of conservation of World Heritage Sites? The, the best tool so far, I think, is IUCN's World Heritage uh, Outlook. And uh, uh, Michelle, you could change the slide. It mon monitors natural and mixed sites. Uh, there are 252 of those and tracks their state of conservation. It's based on desk reviews from IUCN networks. And I believe that the current report had over uh, 700 experts who inputted to that report. The data is available in global reports and an easy to use publicly accessible website, which is the image you're seeing now. And then Michelle, if you can just uh, put the last two up. It's had three cycles so far, 2014, 2017, 2020. So we can actually see the trends and changes, but it's not really a call to civil society per se. Outlook gathers its information from experts and NGOs in the IUCN network. So it's it's also and so that's one limitation. And the other limitation is that it only as assesses natural values of the 39 mixed sites. And sadly, there's no parallel system for cultural world heritage sites, which in fact constitute 80% uh, of the world heritage sites. So I'm hoping as I close, I what my hope is that you have some ideas about systems or platforms that could improve the gathering of information on World Heritage Sites. And it would be especially useful to consider systems that could integrate cultural and natural sites into a single publicly accessible database and provide opportunities for the involvement of civil society in finding solutions for the protection and conservation of our sites. So I really look forward to the discussions in the breakout rooms and thank you for your attention. Thank you, Christina, for your own words of wisdom and so clear uh, messages about what the gaps are. Uh, I, I have to admit that it's been a very long day 
and this brings uh, some small mistakes. Uh, I have forgotten to give the floor to my colleague Haifa Abdullahim to provide a recap from sessions number one and number two. So Haifa, the floor is yours and I apologize to Elizabeth Seals. Haifa. Thank you, uh, Mario, and thank you for everybody who's joining. Like, uh, it's a long day and night, let's say, because some of us already started like yesterday for you. So it's a very long day. So uh, for the recap, uh, it's actually been very intense discussion, like, and very, although that with, let's say, everybody were complaining that it's, the time is limited, but it's we came keep, we came out with like a numerous information and like recommendations from experts who joined like gladly joined and they offered and shared their experiences. So uh, we actually been uh, exposed to like a wide uh, range of techniques, approaches, innovational solution to all issues that uh, experts or like academia or whoever working in the field. Uh, face to overcome their issues, uh, let's say conservation issues, sometimes interpretation issues. It's also uh, one of the questions we always uh, we ask and they, it's like, it's about the values of the site. They always develop their techniques and their uh, IT like information technologies, approaches and tools based on these, uh, like based in their understanding of their values and their sites. And this is actually which help them to uh, document, properly document and monitor the values. Uh, it's also, um, it has, it's it give a window now uh, when we were talking about it because the theme, our theme is now we were talking about, uh, like every single uh, session is talking about cultural literature linkages. So it's actually open the discussion for how we can use these uh, technologies to bridge and enhance the linkages between cultural and natural heritage and overcome this division. And uh, it's uh, one of the questions also we were trying to answer. And actually I cannot summarize everything because it was really, as I said, very long and it's like dense and intense discussions. Like how we can define the best technology, the most efficient technologies. It's also based on like uh, several issues. We did not, we were not able to came out with like one specific up, like a tool to be the best one, but it's actually we were talking about approaches more than uh, tools as it, uh, itself. And also we were talking uh, uh, like um, what kind, like it's also defined what kind of approaches we are use or tools is defined based on what we are, what kind of data we are seeking to acquire, like what kind of information, how this could help my, my purpose and my goal. And, and based on that, we can uh, define the, our approaches. One of the most uh, like uh, was, let's say shocking or like very striking uh, messages came out with the discussion that we were talking about culture and natural. It's like we, with the discussion we came out with that it's the World Heritage Convention somehow partially was, it's like the, the, the driving reason behind the division between cultural and natural heritage based on the history of the convention, because it used at the beginning used to have two, uh, two, lists, of, uh, two lists of criteria, which somehow uh, like enable this division. However, this is not like the case with the local communities, with people on the ground, people like, not like people who really live in these environment and these heritage places. And also it was also by uh, scientific and academic people uh, that who also were like tend to, create this division. And now we are trying to think how we can work on more integral part because uh, whatever we do, we should work in two, in both, uh, both live in both uh, field to, uh, to work as a heritage place, not as a nature, her a natural value or cultural value to enhance the man monitoring and conservation of the site. Otherwise it will be like partial, we will achieve partial uh, conservation. The challenges, uh, although the pandemic create huge challenges for some, some of us uh, like traveling and going around, but also create opportunities such as like younger generation now have the ability to emerge and uh, to be able, because they are more capable to handle the new technologies, this new tech. So it's actually give them the chance to, uh, to be more visible 
one of also the the, the challenges being discussed in this in the um, in the sessions that financial capacities and also the most striking thing is the authority willings like sometimes it's like the national authorities they don't really have the willing to include these new technologies and also the challenges are also most of these information technology uh, in some part of the world like in an arab region or africa or i don't maybe other countries it's uh, like all these projects is not sustainable. It is based on ad hoc basis, based on like if we have international project, they implement the project. And when they leave all these technology, they move back with the expert who came, which also uh, calls that these kind of things, uh, these kind of technologies are not sustainable on the site. Innovation based, we, as Christina already mentioned, the IUCN outlook assessment actually, what well, this uh, outlook assessment to create a lot of uh, like uh, debate and discussions how we can further elaborate on this uh, topic how we can if we have like kind of open data kit is it like uh, it would be helpful but uh, one of the issues uh, being discussed this morning mainly in session a which is the intellectual property issues and copyright issues and how we can handle that so it is, it would be a help, helpful thing, but maybe there is also need, we need to discuss on another, another level how we can protect these, uh, like the owner of these data. Uh, we were also by um, a commerce general director, she actually brought an, uh, and also Tim Badman from IUCN, they brought a good point that how we can use this IT information technology to be able to overcome the language barriers, to enable to enable wider, uh, wider people and wider uh, spectrum of experts to be a, a part of this field, because when we help them to overcome the languages, uh, language issues, and uh, one of also the things what came over and over in all sessions that is involving local people and local communities, civil society will be helpful to achieve better and conservation measures on the site. And enhance the interpretation uh, of uh, of sites. And uh, by this, I end. And I just will ask the other uh, anchors if they have, and if I miss like major points, that's it. And thank you, Mario, and thank you, everybody. Thank you, Haifa, for your intensive work during all these sessions, in particular session two B that you were sharing with me. It's been a really an excellent journey all this day working with you. All right, so it gives me a great honor to introduce to you Elizabeth Seals, is the Executive Director of the International Coalition of Sites and Con of Conscience. Elizabeth Seals guides the strategic growth and direction of a striving coalition of over 300 museums, historic sites, and memory initiative in 65 countries. Prior to joining the coalitions, Liz served as CEO of Cine Rich, a foundation supporting film and media projects focusing on social change as an executive director in projects, focus, I'm sorry, focuses on social change as an executive director of Film Aid International, a humanitarian relief organization using film and video to address the needs of refugees and other displaced communities. As a featured speaker at conferences and workshops around the world, Liz has addressed issues ranging from psycho social relief initiative in displaced communities to the role of memory in building civic engagement in emerging democracies and post-conflict settings. She has served on the board of ECOM US, the US National Committee of the International Council of Museums, is an international advisor to the accounts of the conflict project at the University of Ulster, INCOR, and is a member of the Law Advisory Council for the Fetzner Institute. And we are very pleased that Liz had the time to share with us her wonderful experience. Liz, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Mario. Um, and it's a great pleasure to be a part of this uh, very exciting initiative. Um, I'm going to take just a few minutes and um, share my thoughts on the importance of multiple narratives and the use of um, information technology to um, uh, collect and, and share multiple narratives. And I'll share a few examples just to, to seed our mm -hmm. conversation in um, the uh, coming hour and or so and over the coming uh, weeks. So I'll start by saying that heritage sites at their best are truth tellers. 
they pulsate with the power of the stories they hold, but those stories don't necessarily unfold organically or fully, especially those that are complex, contested, or divisive, as most indeed are. Yet if those stories aren't harnessed in the service of truth-telling, heritage sites can deepen divides, reinforce false or revisionist narratives, or reopen old wounds, rather than be a force for good, for new perspectives, for new understandings, for healing. How can we ensure that heritage sites harness their power for good rather than deepen divides? By creating opportunities for the full story of a site to be shared in all its complexity with courage and transparency, leaving room for evolving understandings all of which calls for interpretation that is inclusive, grounded in and emerging from a multiplicity of perspectives and experiences. Technology can be an essential part of this process of welcoming multiple narratives and fostering engagement. And I'd like to share a few examples of sites of conscience, memory and heritage sites, using technology in innovative ways right now with this goal in mind. These examples will show that technology can be used to collect stories, to share stories, and to invite deeper engagement in history and heritage. So we'll start with mapping and the center photograph on, on this slide. My organization is working with sites of memory across the Middle East and North Africa region to develop a digital map that marks sites of human rights violations, former prisons and checkpoints, for example. The digital map documents the location of the sites and shares personal stories of survivors of those sites, all of which is then accessible to the general public. This is an example of using technology for sharing documentation, perspectives, and stories, but also for the ongoing collection of stories that can deepen understanding of past events and encourage the prevention of recurrence. So now we'll move on to ESMA. During the civil military dictatorship in Argentina, the Navy School of Me Mechanics or ESMA in Buenos Aires operated as a clandestine detention, torture and extermination center. But today ESMA is a museum and a site of memory, raising awareness on crimes against humanity that took place during the dictatorship, as well as the pursuit of justice that followed grounded in truth telling. ESMA has recently launched a series of open conversations called ESMA Virtual Meetings with survivors of the site. Conversations with survivors that are live streamed through ESMA's Facebook page and YouTube channel and recorded to be later accessed online or in person as part of the exhibits at the museum itself. And now to President Lincoln's Cottage in Washington, DC where every day the staff finds itself in conversation with visitors on difficult topics from slavery to grief to immigration. Visitors often ask the staff questions that on their face might seem straightforward or simple, but on second look, they contain a level of complexity that leaves the staff wanting to explore them more fully. So they started the Q and Abe podcast to dive deeper into these challenging topics. Now in his third season, the podcast has a large following and has won multiple awards. On the next slide, we'll have a few examples of social media as a platform for collecting or sharing multiple narratives. First to Voices of Women Media in Nepal. Voices of Women Media works to offer access to media technology and all kinds of arts so that girls and women can voice their own lives to raise hidden and silenced issues in their communities. They believe telling one's own story changes a person and a community, fostering broad transformation by building agency as well as individual and collective power. This project called The Whole Family invites photographers to go out into rural communities and document who is missing. In this case, they're often family members who have been disappeared during conflict. And these photos highlighting the missing then become part of social media campaigns and public exhibitions. We also see here the Partition Museum in India, 
where via Zoom, museum staff are currently collecting oral histories of survivors of the partition for the museum's archives, as well as for public exhibits. And we see War Childhood Museum in Bosnia and Herzegovina, which has launched an advocacy campaign to raise awareness of the effects of atrocity on children by inviting the public to share their own stories on Instagram. Now, while not pictured here, I'd like to end with District 6 Museum in Cape Town, South Africa. District 6 was originally a vibrant community of freed slaves, merchants, artisans, laborers, and immigrants, the polar opposite of what the apartheid government wanted people to believe in. In 1966, it was declared a whites only area by the apartheid regime. And by 1982, more than 60,000 people had been forcibly removed, their houses in District 6 flattened by bulldozers. District 6 Museum was later created to remember and personalize not only this history, but the resilience of District 6 community members in the face of this destruction. The museum's online oral history program leverages technology for the collection of community members' stories, as well as mapping what was in the district. So in closing, I'd like to bring us back to where we started with why multiple narratives are essential. As you enter District 6 Museum, you'll see the following words. Remember District 6. Remember the racism that took away our homes and our livelihood and sought to steal away our humanity. Remember also our will to live, to hold us fast to that which marks us as human beings, our generosity, our love of justice, and our care for each other. Thank you. Thank you, Liz. Excellent presentation. I think that your words about harness, their power for good, uh, really resonate with me a lot. And uh, so let's let's uh, invite our next speaker, Cyril Cormos, is executive director, Wild Heritage, a project of Earth Island Institute and has served as vice chair for World Heritage on IUCN's World Commission on Protected Areas, WSCPA, since 12, 2012. He sits on the IUCN WCPA steering committee, chairs the IUCN WCPA World Heritage Network and serves as an NGO liaison to the World Heritage Program. Cyril is also a member of the editorial board of IUCN's Parts Journal, as well as an associate editor for the International Journal of Wilderness. He holds a BA in English from University of California at Berkeley and a Master's in Science in Politics of the World Economy from the London School of Economics and a GED from George Washington University's Law School. He's based in Berkeley, California in the United States. Cyril, thank you so much for accepting our invitation and the floor is yours. Um, so uh, on the subject of, of monitoring and assessing the state of conservation of natural world heritage sites, um, I think there have been a number of exciting developments over the last few years, um, which I'll just touch on very briefly before saying a few more words um, uh, in reference to IUCN's uh, World Heritage Outlook uh, mechanism, which Christina mentioned and which I think is, is a fundamentally important um, element to this discussion. Um, and yes, this will be a PowerPoint free uh, presentation, so uh, no, no slides to follow. Um, so uh, the, the challenge on the natural side, of course, is how to monitor um, sites uh, and to assess their integrity, um, uh, including sites that are often extremely large and extremely remote um, and difficult, uh, difficult to access. And the, the good news is that um, the quality of remote sensing um, technologies that are available from, from radar to uh, aircraft borne LIDAR, which are laser sensors um, uh, used to assess the condition of, of ecosystems, um, to satellite imagery uh, is all improving dramatically. We now have Google Earth. It's now possible to, to essentially monitor in real time from, from space or from, uh, from a plane, uh, what's happening on the ground at, at large scales. Um, and beyond that, it's possible to do it at a much higher resolution that was ever possible before 
and to measure things like carbon stocks and tree diversity and plant diversity um, uh, on a scale that wasn't previously possible. So the quality of the information um, is improving dramatically. Um, and on the ground, uh, there also have been a number of technological improvements from uh, in particular, using relatively low-tech things like cell phones and camera traps that will measure uh, an intrusion into a park, poaching, um, and other uh, uh, illegal activities. So <clears throat> the capacity to generate information uh, is improving, and, and that's good news. Um, and it's getting much uh, finer scale, and it's, it's giving us a much clearer picture of the ecosystem integrity of sites, which is critical. Um, for the integrity and for, for measuring uh, the state of conservation of these places and to, to gather essential information on things like climate change. Um, but all of that needs to be processed and all of that needs to be assessed and all of that needs to be compressed into uh, an understanding of the condition of the site and the capacity of that site to maintain its outstanding universal value over time. And that's where the World Heritage Outlook um, uh, process that IUCN started has come into play and it's become a very important process, um, not intended to uh, uh, replace in any way the, the official reporting process, but to give another dimension and to provide um, an understanding of what's happening on a shorter time frame um, for all sites at the same time. Um, and so, as Christina mentioned, it's a very, very extensive review process involving uh, 700 experts or more doing a desktop review of the state of conservation of each site and an assessment of the capacity of that site to maintain its values into the future. I think a few things are important to highlight um, in, you know, in thinking about how this kind of tool could be applied um, on the cultural side as well and, and for mixed sites. Um, one is the huge number of experts that are involved. You have to coordinate hundreds of experts over um, a, you know, essentially a two year period to gather all, all the information. Um, but you also have to uh, provide an independent review of the independent experts um, to make sure that the assessments are reasonable and of high quality. Um, and to ensure that you don't have significant discrepancies um, over time between the different outlook assessments. In other words, if you have a site that, that is um, extremely well managed and all of a sudden three years later, it's being described as, as a very poorly managed site, um, you, know, you have to be able to understand whether there has been a real decline in the management of that site or whether it is you know, a change in reviewers who have provided a slightly different opinion. Um, and so you do have to do some, some, some reconciling. So what that all means is that you have to have an effective mechanism to uh, process hundreds of experts um, and to uh, understand their qualifications in, in conservation um, in general and in World Heritage in particular, um, and you need to manage that process. Um, and it's, it's not just an IUCN process because no World Heritage Outlook Assessment is complete unless it has been um, reviewed by, uh, should they wish to do so, um, by the government in question. So the really, I think the, the, the big point about Outlook is that it, it provides an, an excellent mechanism for desktop review of sites on a very regular basis uh, at three year intervals. And I think it's becoming more and more precise and more and more accurate. Um, but it requires um, an enormous amount of management and it requires um, very significant management of people to make, to make this work. Um, so um, I, I do think that what it does is it gives us a much more accurate picture of whether sites are being well managed or not. Um, and you know what the what the outlook assessment has has demonstrated is that you know only about half of the of the sites are currently in the good or good with some concerns categories in terms of, of management. So there's a significant job to be done. Um, I think I'll, I'll stop there, um, but 
I think the the outlook assessment is is a mechanism that the next you know the next step in in the outlook assessment is to allow the site managers to be in touch with each other addressing um, common problems around the world. And what we've done is we've we've set up a IUCN has set up a mechanism that provides an excellent rating system and a very good picture of what's happening on the ground. Um, now it needs to become a tool that allows site managers to work together to address common issues, to share uh, ideas, to share solutions to challenges that have been particularly effective, to share access to funds and so on and so forth. So I think that's the next um, the next step for Outlook is to turn it into something that is truly um, extremely interactive um, and and if IUCN can do that with WCPA and other partners I think it'll be extremely exciting because we do have a site managers forum and we do have all this information um, and now the next step I believe is is to bring it all together and and synchronize it and it'll become very powerful but thank you very much thank you Cyril thank you for explaining the outlook I think it's a great idea I hope that other organizations such as ICOMOS could also consider this okay. so Christina the floor is yours uh, th thank you Mario and and uh, thank you uh, Cyril for that explanation of outlook I I still hope for hearing a dialogue on whether or not some form of outlook could actually be adapted to cultural sites but that's not not your your burden so let me introduce the next speaker the next our next speaker is a canadian architect douglas pritchard and he's now a senior research fellow at cypress university of technology in the area of 3d visualization <laughs> and he's the adjunct professor an adjunct professor at johns hopkins university in the cultural heritage management masters program he's specialized in the creation of interactive virtual environments immersive 3D experiences and customized software development. And some of you will know some of his projects. Their notable projects include the documentation of Cologne Cathedral, which is a UNESCO World Heritage Site, as you know, and the development of the urban model for Glasgow and also the Scottish 10 project, which got a lot of publicity at the time. So Doug, Douglas, thank you for being with us and the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Christina, for the introduction and also putting me to the position of professor at Johns Hopkins University. That's actually quite fantastic. I should clarify that I'm a lecturer at Johns Hopkins, um, uh, but uh, I can always dream. Um, so my presentation is on uh, digital technologies, recording and presentation, and I would qualify that as as-built cultural heritage. And uh, the, the quick uh, overview that I'm going to provide you probably deals with a lot of stuff that you're, many of you are familiar with. And I apologize for going over some really basic stuff, but uh, there may be others that uh, aren't familiar with the technology. Um, a lot of this is based on my personal experience. I've been involved with uh, 3D scanning for almost 15 years now. Uh, my first big project was the urban model of Glasgow, which began back in 2005. Uh, where uh, while at the Glasgow School of Art, we scanned over 1,200 buildings in the city center of Glasgow, Scotland. Um, at the time, uh, laser scanning was considered the best tool, uh, although uh, very cutting edge um, as it was fast, accurate, or relatively fast, accurate and objective um, in recording the urban environment uh, to build a dimensionally accurate virtual representation of the city. Um, the model is actively being used by the city of Glasgow for urban design, heritage review, public engagement, public planning and management, and even uh, court proceedings. Um, from that project, I, as mentioned by Christina, I moved to uh, working with uh, David Mitchell, Dr. David Mitchell at Historic Environment Scotland, where the Scottish 10 project uh, was developed. And that was the five, uh, the documentation of the five Scottish UNESCO World Heritage Sites and five international sites. Um, since then, uh, or at least over the last 15 years, I've been involved with 25 medium to large 3D scan based visualization projects, which includes nine uh, UNESCO World Heritage Sites. And these are being the data and the projects um, range in, in complexity. Uh, but deal with issues of conservation, repair, um, updating as-built records, 
and developing 3D interpretive content. Um, this is where um, many of you are familiar, so I'll be very quick about this. Um, digital technologies, uh, where are we with that? And um, I'd say for uh, cultural heritage, we still have the two big things, uh, two big methods. Uh, I'm not touching upon 360 degree photography and actually I, I, I'm not addressing satellite data, but um, the two that uh, I think are the most important right now is laser scanning. So that's terrestrial and aerial systems. So uh, they have survey grade accuracy. Uh, they can connect to an existing survey network and integrate um, and the scanners can integrate with other sensors like high dynamic range imagery and thermal in imagery. The problem though is there's two, I guess, main problems. One is that the software has a deep learning curve. Um, so you need specialized uh, technicians to do that. And the hardware is still uh, extremely expensive. So uh, likely out of reach for even uh, the majority of um, of uh, even UNESCO World Heritage Sites. So that's a bit of a challenge. Um, what has changed, I'd have to say over the years has been digital photogrammetry. Um, that's both camera and UAV. Um, it, the software has really improved tremendously. Um, and you're seeing a lot of that now on the internet through websites like Sketchfab where uh, individuals are generating incredibly uh, photorealistic models of their favorite heritage sites. And I think there's a potential for things like crowdsourcing with this method, um, you know, simply with your iPhone taking pictures and things like people experimenting with virtual repatriation. Um, at present though, from my side, um, and I'm open to be corrected, I wouldn't use it for a construction survey or a very uh, critical engineering survey, but combining photogrammetry with laser scanning, I think is right now a fantastic <clears throat> method of representing a, uh, um, a, a heritage site. Um, on the software side, the software has also improved over the last 10 years, data reg registration uh, is no longer an incredible nightmare. It can be done almost automatically. Um, the organization of data is getting better. Um, there are software packages like Recap um, that are doing a great job, very simple software to use. Um, but, and then on the photogrammetry side, you have things like Capturing Reality, which is a really an amazing piece of software. Um, and then in, in terms of getting it, uh, things out to the public, you have um, Sketchfab. Um, which I think is uh, a great uh, tool, kind of like the YouTube of 3D. Um, the branding and the association with other models on Sketchfab, I think they're problematic. I, I do think that eventually Sketchfab, or I hope that Sketchfab can have dedicated sites uh, for each heritage site that uh, is integrated into the main heritage site website. Um, on the fringe, or actually not necessarily on the fringe, and it's good and bad, you're seeing software engines, game engines like Unreal and Unity that are being uh, really providing some fantastic uh, um, tools to visualize a heritage site online and interact with it. Um, one thing, this is, uh, I'm, I'm obviously a tech guy, um, the one thing that isn't as um, visually uh, uh, um, fantastic as Unreal uh, in a game engine is uh, Sintu Cloud. This is more about the, the management of data. And I like the fact, I like the software quite a bit. And I think there'll be other companies that produce similar types of software systems where you generate a tremendous amount of data on a site and that goes up to a cloud-based system um, and it's protected on the cloud. Um, the security is, uh, I'm assuming, extremely high so that the data could be protected, but it's a good way to communicate, I would think, um, from a World Heritage Site, say, to UNESCO on the condition of a building so that it isn't, it isn't a big presentation, but it is a method of 3D communication. And what I like about this software method is that it's not, um, the use of it is very, very straightforward. Um, navigating through it is very simple. And uh, you know anyone, uh, a site manager can then upload their data and it could be reviewed anywhere in the world. Um, the recording side of things, I think it is almost too easy to record. 
even with a laser scanner or a phone. Um, and the result is how do you determine quality? And one project that we're working on is a European Commission project called VG 2020 uh, 654 at the Cyprus University of Technology. And the purpose of the commission is to determine the level and quality and standards in 3D cultural heritage documentation. And that's an extremely uh, critical issue. Um, people are commissioning scan projects and they don't really know what they're getting into. They can't determine the level of quality. Um, they, they're not entirely sure what is accurate and what isn't accurate. Um, factors such as the degree of detail, the geometric accuracy of it, say a 3D shape, um, and uh, things like precision and resolution. These are complex terms, uh, or simple terms, but complex issues that need to be addressed um, in, a, in a universal fashion. Um, this is under development currently, but will be released by the European Commission publicly, hopefully at the end of the year. Um, if interested in this topic, Historic Environment Scotland and English Heritage, I have to say, have two uh, outstanding publications on digital recording for heritage. Um, the last thing, and this is, this is actually how I would explain documentation for students at Johns Hopkins. And, um, and I'm an architect, so everything can be explained by an architectural analogy. Um, if you were to build a house and you only need an image for a magazine, you wouldn't really care if the building is, is torn down after the photo shoot. It's wasteful, but you've got your photograph. If you want something more permanent, you need to build a house on a strong foundation and have a concern for the quality of, of uh, construction. Applying this to cultural heritage in 3D, it is relatively easy to generate a stunning 3D model on your iPhone of a heritage object or structure. But what about the level of accuracy, precision, and resolution? Do you want the project to last, uh, or do you want uh, the documentation to last one project or multiple projects? So the point being is that data acquisition can be very expensive, especially if you are considering purchasing a laser scanner. But good dimensional foundation data um, within a project can then make the project timeless. It lasts for years. So the production costs will increase. But the other thing that I get into in, at Hopkins is looking at using that foundation data of scanning and good photogrammetry, um, not just for engineering and maintenance and architectural purposes, but also for the same data set for interpretation and exhibition. And the point there is that you're, you're spreading the cost of the initiative among a variety of groups. Um, so I think that's very important. Um, and just to wrap up, uh, I think um, on the future, uh, looking at things like crowdsourced photogrammetry, clearly that's, that's an issue. And I think with the topic at hand, um, using crowdsourced photogrammetry to monitor a site can be very helpful. Um, and then uh, software types like uh, sin 2 Cloud as well, um, putting the data up online um, uh, from anywhere in the world, as long as there's a reasonable internet connection. Um, and then I guess the, the, the ultimate goal or dream is to combine all of this architectural and as-built data into a more uh, comprehensive data set where you're bringing in intangible data and other narratives uh, all in one location, uh, preferably online and protected. Thank you very much. Okay, thank, thank you very much, Douglas. You, di you didn't like it that I gave you a promotion? I thought, I, I, no, <laughs> I do. <laughs> thank you. But, but I, I appreciate your last comment because I do think it's important to, to bring, make this useful for the site level as, and the connection to UNESCO and so on. So that's, that's really important. Our next speaker is another Douglas, this time Douglas Comer. He is the president of Cultural Site Research and Management Foundation, which is based in Baltimore, which as he says is still fine. And for over, for two decades, he was the chief of the National Parks, US National Park Service Applied Archeology span Center. He specializes in planning for the management and interpretation of archeological sites and landscapes and in the use of aerial and satellite remote sensing for archeological research and resource protection. He is a fellow at the, um, I can't give you a promotion as well. He is a fellow at the Johns Hopkins University Whitting School of Engineering and the Department of Near Eastern Studies. 
He's president of the US National Committee of ICOMAS and vice president of the ICOMAS Advisory Committee and chair of the ICOMAS National Committee Council. So Douglas, the floor is yours. I can unmute, I can. Um, first, I wanna thank you for inviting me to this. It's, it, I expected it to be very good, but it's, it, is, it is exceeding my expectations, just wonderful. Um, <clears throat> I'm gonna be talking mostly about monitoring uh, sites with the use of remotely sensed data collected from satellite and aerial platforms. I'm an archeologist, but I'm among those who found many years ago that cultural sites are inextricably related to natural environment. There's a dialectic that occurs. People are attracted to certain environments and then proceed to alter those environments. They further adapt to the alter environment until in many cases, over and over again, successful adaptation is no longer possible. This is a problem we, we are dealing with on a global basis at this moment in time. So we have, but we have some tools now that we didn't have before. We have new satellite and airborne systems that are emerging very rapidly and new remote sensing technologies and ways of analyzing remotely sensed data are being developed very, very quickly. Interesting uh, developments. I'm, and I've got some slides here and I can't sort of see them. Do you see the one of the North Ngorgo crater? You see that? There it is right there. Yep. This model uh, was produced and this has been done. This is, not, this is not like a new approach, but it just, it, just, um, it needs to be done. <laughs> it's very useful. Um, this model was produced from data collected by Landsat, which has been around more than 40 years, and Sentinel-2 multispectral satellites. And the data were collected between 2002 and 2017. And perhaps some of you know, by running algorithms on some of the multispectral bands, it's possible to assess the health and vigor of vegetation. Now this area is almost completely grassland, but what we see here indicates that large areas have either lost grass cover or that the grass cover has been greatly reduced. The grasses feed herds of ungulates that in turn provide sustenance for the largest concentration of predators in the world. Therefore, the changes in grass cover could have serious implications for maintaining this concentration of predators. And in the next slide, um, we, we, it should show disturbance of the Nazca World Heritage Site. You see the, uh, yeah, there we go. Specifically, disturbance of the hummingbird geoglyph. When Greenpeace made a mistake, they placed plastic strips near the head of the hummingbird to spell out a message. This occurred on December 8, 2014. And this was between two synthetic aperture radar data takes that were made with the NASA UAV, UAV SAR platform, uh, aircraft in this case, on March 9, 2013 and March 23, uh, uh, 20, March 23, 2015. Now, SAR returns are influenced by even minute changes to topography. So by comparing the two data takes, we could assess the degree to which terrain on and near the hummingbirds had been disturbed. So you see the hummingbird and you see that they actually walked over the head of the hummingbird. We can actually see that the, uh, the path that was taken to install the sign is quite interesting. The third slide, you wanna to move to that. Coral dangers are in danger, I'm sorry, coral reefs are in danger all over the world. Certainly climate change is a major factor, but so is development on these places that generate silt that ultimately finds its way to coral reefs, smothering the spats that will eventually grow into coral. So here we see how multispectral data collected from Sentinel-2 can be used to assess turbidity that is largely produced by the silt. And Sentinel-2 has a revisit time of six days. So actually monitoring can be constant. And Sentinel-2 was, was launched just a few years ago. 
a lot of these uh, satellite systems, um, with the exception of uh, Landsat, um, are, are quite quite new. And the next slide. This is lidar, or light detection and ranging data. Now, it's been collected from aerial platforms for some time, but there's a problem with that because the major expense is getting the lidar mechanism on an aircraft to the place you want to collect the LIDAR data. And this is especially a problem in remote locations. So we've been working, for example, in at the Federated States of Micronesia, which is near, not near anywhere. <laughs> so the cost of flying an aircraft there is really almost prohibitive. What we're doing right now is working with NASA. Uh, NASA has, has uh, has, has, has launched a new satellite called ISAT-2. Uh, they've also placed a LIDAR uh, instrument on the International Space Station. Um, and now what we're trying to do, and we're meeting with a certain amount of success already, is to merge this LIDAR data that's collected from satellites with other satellite data, or, other data collected from satellite platforms, including synthetic aperture radar and multispectral radar. We've been very successful in developing bathymetric models this way. Um, and now we're going to be looking at um, how we can detect changes in vegetative structure, as well as possibly detecting archaeological sites in these remote locales that are covered by very dense vegetation. And once we uh, locate them. Of course, we can take steps to protect them. And I just, this is just the tip of the iceberg. Just some of the new technologies and new analytical techniques that will expand our ability to monitor cultural and natural sites enormously. Uh, there will be a time when there's no place to hide. Thank you. Thank you very much, Douglas. That's really interesting to see the, the new, the new, new. Uh, and I guess with the increase in satellites up there, it's going to be, as you say, no place to hide. Um, my next speaker is Mario, who actually needs no introduction, Mario Santana. He's a member of our steering panel for our World Heritage, and he's co-convener with Haifa of this theme on the transformational impact of information technology. Mario is a professor in architectural conservation and sustainability engineering at Carleton. A university in Ottawa and a faculty member of the Carleton Immersive Media Studio. He is in particular the director of the NSERC Heritage Engineering Program, where he nurtures and fosters the careers and de intellectual development of a lot of young people, some, several of whom are working with us today. Mario's research interest involves digital advancement flow workflows for recorded buildings in 3D with a high resolution of detail as well as design approaches for handling, storing, and presenting large volumes of data generated from the heritage information gathering activities. And I would be remiss if I didn't congratulate him on his recent election as Secretary General of ICOMAS. So Mario, the floor is yours. Thank you, Christina, thank you for your kind words. And yes, indeed, we have many of my uh, researchers helping us with the, with the glowing art, and I'm really thankful to them. So. I'm going to speak really fast because we are running out of time and, you know, being one of the conveners of the event, we don't want to be so late. So uh, this is a slide that comes actually from an article on the World Heritage Review, the last issue that deals with COVID. If you have the opportunity, I would advise you to download that uh, from the UNESCO World Heritage website. So in this case, we see 90% of World Heritage sites partially or completely closed. So this gives us a kind of a picture of how the impact of, of COVID has been intensified in World Heritage. And in particular, in those two issues that we're discussing now, monitoring and also presentation or remote access to, to visit the sites while they are closed. So the next slide, please. So I, I just want to highlight a number of issues that I think are important for us to discuss throughout this uh, Globinar and in particular, throughout the information technologies uh, theme. So we have an historic opportunity to develop strategies uh, to implement information technologies to kind of uh, mitigate these issues of lockdowns 
and then gradually reopening of sites. And in this case, I just throw some ideas, adopt strategies to gradually digitize access. We have seen that many institutions, heritage institutions are not able to manage their sites or not able to, to work from home because most of the archives are not digitized. I mean, I am not only talking about maps or digital platforms, I'm talking about management plans, data, etc. cetera. Uh, so also connect between data providers and users. This is an opportunity to collaborate with many of the cloud services that are out there. And I would stress that, you know, Doc uh, was explaining some of these services and there is an opportunity to maybe collaborate and see some synergies there. Video conferencing, for instance, we who would say that we will be here across the world having a 24 hours webinar with a, about 700 people from around the world. We should continue doing this. Uh, I think that this is a good a sustainable issue. Uh, it's good for the planet and it's also good for the sustainability of many of our organizations. I'm talking about ICOMOS in particular. Uh, adopt critical remote inf infrastructure monitoring strategies. There are many sensors, internet of things that have been used to monitor uh, sites uh, in remote areas, and also deploy remote access to world heritage using digital platforms. And we have some of them uh, portrayed here. How can you provide at least a teaser on how you can access that site while you cannot go physically there? And I think that with this, I'm going to conclude, but I wanted to say something funny because uh, actually Doug was saying this about the satellite images, but I was talking to, to, to a friend of mine, uh, Will Megary, that probably Doug knows very well, and Will was saying, well, when I live in Northern Ireland, it's always cloudy. So, I mean, satellite images do not work here. So I think that still there are many challenges with, uh, with technologies that, that, should, uh, that we can overcome. All right, so thank you so much uh, for these keynote sessions. I'm going to take over uh, from Christina now. And now I would like to introduce you to Michelle Duon, who is a researcher at the Carton Immersive Media Studio, and is one of our co-anchors. And I would say one of our core co-anchors, because without Michelle, probably the Globinars session one through, through four would not have happened. So Michelle, the floor is yours to take us through some nice things. Hi, everybody. I know we're a little bit behind schedule, but I just wanted to give you guys a sense of who's in this room. So we've just activated this poll. If you can click on the link in the Zoom chat, let us know which UNESCO World Heritage Sites you are associated with, if any. We'll just leave this open for about 30 seconds to a minute, and then uh, let's, see, let's see what we get here. Very cool. Okay, we're gonna shut it down in 10 seconds. 10, nine. <clears throat> Three, two, one. Okay, great. And then we're going to go to the next one. Which UNESCO region are you from? And since you all have the links open, this should be a lot faster. Europe and North America, no surprise for this time zone. Some Latin America, Caribbean. Okay, great. And then the next question, what best describes your affiliation? Acad academia always shoots up pretty fast in these polls. We got some civil society, NGOs. Fantastic. And the last one. How familiar are you with using information technologies related to world heritage? Total experts to not at all. Just a little bit. We've got some modest people here. Great. Fantastic. So